Hello everyone, so off the bat this video contains spoilers. So, uh, I was thinking of a way to try to do a spoiler fee review, spoiler fee review, spoiler free review, but unfortunately I, I tend to just nose dive into things and I don't want to accidentally say something. Um, I do have something of like a script written down, like I, I watched the episode again, I watched it a few times as I said I would in uh, the reaction video I'm going to upload later on uh, this coming week. Um... But, uh, anywho, so yeah, spoilers, if you haven't seen the episode yet, get off this video, go watch it, then come back if you feel like listen to me ramble about Volume 4, Chapter 12. I'm actually gonna kind of sort of talk about the whole volume, as, or the volume as a whole, mainly focus on Episode 12, but I'll also sort of explain how the overall volume made me feel. So, I'll get more into detail with this actual episode than I will with the, you know, the previous ones, and, uh, I'll actually kind of sort of touch on, uh, yeah, volumes one, two, and three. Since I got into Ruby right at right about when chapter four was about to start, is uh, when I got into it. Um, so, anyways, or no, not when chapter four was about to start. It was when chapter three was about, or chapter three, volume three was about to end. Because uh, yeah, I think I yeah I caught it on Renegade Track. Yeah, because I remember watching the. Uh, I think I kept saying I watched the first episode. I forgot what video I said that in, but I didn't watch the first episode. I watched the trailers, uh, the red trailer, the black trailer, and all those. I thought they were just little anime snippets that uh, Rooster Teeth was making. But uh, anyways, this volume definitely felt... Oh, yeah, again, spoiler warning, spoiler warning, because I know people are, you know, <laughs> they don't want shit spoiled, so... I'm going to put it in the description, it's going to be in the title, so if you end up watching this video and you start yelling at me like, oh, you spoiled it, well, it, it's your own fault. But anywho, I digress. Uh, this volume was overhyped by fans, it it really was, because I saw some of the comments on the Rooster Teeth site, and some of them were like, this volume was disappointing, and, you know, not a whole lot happened. I'm like, it's a setup volume, because if you think about it, what do we get in this volume? We got a fucking roster of villains now. We have Watts, we have Hazel. Um, those two, we haven't really seen what they can do, although I'm wagering a guess that Watts is more of a technical type dude. He, he knows like how to uh, build programs and stuff like that, because I think he was the guy that made the virus that Cinder used in volume two and three to uh, hijack the network and whatnot. Uh, Hazel, of course, uh, is probably going to be some like big just... Um, bruiser type dude and then we got to see Tyrion, who was fucking amazing probably my second favorite villain overall my favorite is still roman torchwick um i don't know if we'll have a ever have a villain as fun as he is but uh yeah Tyrion definitely won over my soft spot in the finale episode but uh or not the finale but episode 11 uh what else do we get we got to see mistral which mistral looks fucking awesome what but i'll get more into that later uh, we got to learn more about Ozpin, and we got Ren and Nora's backstory as well as, like, the scariest fucking Grimm we've ever had. Um, probably the most badass, too, because I would say that Dragon Grimm was a badass, but it really amounted to nothing more than a wet fart. Because Ruby, like, you know, used her silver eyes and took it out. We didn't really see it do anything except spawn a bunch of Grimm, fly around, wreck the tower, which Cinder could have done on her own. So at the end of the day, that Grimm was kind of pointless, unless it comes back. Because it's not technically dead, it's just frozen on top of uh, Beacon Academy. Uh, so I, I could see them bringing the dragon back for, you know, a big old fight, but, uh, cause we'll eventually get the, you know, liberation of, uh, Beacon Academy, cause there's still Grim wandering around there, and they do need to get rid of that dragon, which makes the question, why haven't they just, like, you know, blown it up or something, but anyways, uh, if you think about all the stuff we've got in this volume, uh, and you also think about how 1 and 2 built up uh, 3 and made it awesome. That's pretty much what I think 4 and 5 will do for Volume 6 if they're going by, you know, 3s. Like, if each act is a set of 3. So I think Volume 5 will will get the setup for the big battle at Haven. And then uh, Volume 6 will be the pretty much the Clash of Titans, if you will. Because I could see Hazel being there. I could see all the White Fang guys being there. Team Ruby being there. Tyrion maybe showing up again, Cinder showing up again, and maybe even having a throwdown with Salem. But I don't know if Salem is like uh, more akin to, let's say, Frieza, where she just prefers other people to do her dirty work for her, or she's more like Cooler, in which she'll actually go out and do the dirty work if it needs to be done uh, personally. Um, but as far as like all the deaths were going, like he, people were speculating that Crow's gonna die, that. Um, uh, what's his name? Or what's their names? Ren and Nora are gonna die. Somebody's gonna die. Uh, what's his name? Son's gonna die. I'm like, no, no. Like 
the fear of a character dying works much more effectively than the character actually dying with this type of uh, storytelling. Because when you kill a character off, it has to have a reason for happening. Penny dying set the tone for the remainder of Volume 3. It was a hard-hitting death, but it wasn't like one of the major characters died. Because at the end of the day, Penny was kind of a supporting character. I wouldn't say a minor character, but she was a supporting character. And yeah, her death was, you know, like, oh shit. Like, if you watch all the reactors when they saw Penny die for the first time, they were all just baffled. Like, they were in shock. Um, Blind Wave, for example, uh, the most recent one that I watched, you know, Eric's just like, what the fuck? Like, you know, what the hell? I thought this was supposed to be a happy-go-lucky show, but... Um, and then Pira dying, she died because she was just too selfless for her own good. Like, she just totally believed in dying for her friends. Like, she had no fear of death, and that was what brought her downfall. It wasn't that she was suicidal or anything like that. She just, she felt she had to do everything she could to stop Cinder. And the way they went about killing her was fantastic from a storytelling point, and it, di it did impact. It impacted everybody because Ruby felt like she had failed Pira and she felt guilty about Pira dying because she felt like it was partially her fault. Jean took it to heart too. Like he's actually looking to better himself. He's not being this pushover, uh, slack jawed idiot that he was in volumes one and two. Uh, three, I felt like he stepped his game up to a degree, but volume four, he has just come such a long way in terms of being a character. Like I, I genuinely like this guy now. Before I was eh about him, I was thinking like, yeah, he'll he'll get to a point where I'll start to like him more, but um, right now, it's at the point for me where I actually dig him as a character, and I do like the way the Team Ranger works together, or has worked together throughout this entire volume. They, they work very fucking well together. Um, but I, to a degree, I could have seen Ren dying to save his friends. Like, he does get the killing blow, but he basically exerts himself too much, kind of like how Tien did against the Saiyans in Dragon Ball Z, um, except he actually manages to kill the thing he was trying to kill instead of, you know, just dying for no fucking reason. Uh, but it wouldn't feel right from a story standpoint, given how, like, tied together Ren and Nora are. Like, if this was the end of the series, I could see them pulling something like that, like having Ren die and Nora going on without him. Like, it would be bittersweet, but at least he died protecting the world, and, you know, everybody's gonna be safe from here on out. But it, 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 yeah, it was just, it was one of those things that's like, nah, it's too soon. And as for uh, Crow, by the time we got to episode 10, I was like, okay, Crow's the red herring. He's, he's the current thing that we're worried about right now to create this conflict and this anxiety of, we need to get this guy some help. Um, we're running out of options. We're running out of time. And you see that when they, you know, have to split up because they're desperate. They, they don't have time to go back and forth or, you know, deal with things and stuff like that. And uh, Ren didn't want anybody to go to Kuro He wanted to avoid it all the way through. But at the same time, he did know that, yeah, we can't go through the mountains with Crow. So it's like, um, but at the same time, he's like, we need to push on. We just need to try it. And then, you know, Nora kind of comes with that compromise of, we can go up to the mountain and maybe see if something is closer around us. While you two go through Kuro and maybe find something, doubt it, but you know, give it a shot. And at the very least, they know that uh, Crow would not survive a trip through the mountains. So Nora's thinking was very rational, and I totally get where she was coming from. She was doing the best possible solution to get Crow the help he needed while at the same time not dragging Ren uh, through, you know, PTSD, uh, essentially, as we learn in episode 10. But, um, yeah, the only death I, have, I actually did not like was Roman's. Like, I was fine with the timing of it. Like, him dying after saying what he said, because he's basically saying, like, you know, this your entire sense of reality is about to get changed. Like, the reality is not like the fairy tales and stuff like that. And then he gets killed. But I get why he died the way he did, because he was pissed off and angry over uh, what uh, Ruby did to uh, Neo, because, you know, she pushed the button and Neo flew off. And he's, like, uncertain if she's alive or, you know, what have you. Then he just flat out hates Ruby because she keeps screwing with his plans. So that negative emotion drew those griffins to him, and it caused one to basically devour him. Um, again, execution-wise, it was anticlimactic, but, you know, um, anyways, that's neither here nor there. That's from a long time ago. So this episode opens with the fight of the uh, Nuklevi versus, I think that's how you say it. That's how, that's how I'm going to say it. If I'm wrong, let me know. 
Uh, and I'll correct myself in future reviews or what have you. Uh, so the Nukla V, uh, it, we open up with the Nukla V fighting Team Ranger, and it starts off with just the sound in the background. Like, you can hear Ren's gun going off, you can hear Ruby's gun going off. Then it cuts to the town where you see smoke and stuff flying about. And then they all get kicked back, except for Ren, who lands just land on his feet. But everybody else, they just get knocked on their asses. And then the reveal of the thing, like, it trots through the smoke, and then you get to see its full form. And I was just like, holy shit, this thing looks so fucking cool. And terrifying, but so cool. <laughs> um, and it was a terrifically designed grim because it pushed Ranger to their limits. Like, they didn't have an easy time with this thing. Like, they barely won. Uh, and I'll get more into that as I kind of go through a little play-by-play -play thing I got here. Um, I thought Ren might have a bit of cowardice to him, but he doesn't, which I was actually glad to see. Like, he was more pissed off and angry. Like, I fucking hate this thing for what it did to my parents to all the people that i knew in this town that i grew up in and he like he had some pent-up aggression so i was like oh god ren you fucking beast i fucking love this but i was wondering if that was gonna bite him in the ass like if he's just gonna be too reckless in his anger which they actually touch on that in this fight and i like that that creates a sense of realism but uh, I, I did kind of get pulled out of the uh immersion when the thing did its uh i guess like the top writer as i said in my that video I did with the episodes 11 and 10, I said the thing kind of slouches off to the side when it's not fighting, and then when it gets into, you know, fighting stances and stuff, it activates, the, the middle part actually comes up and comes to life. But I, I say it in my reaction video that it's like, it's a wacky inflatable arm flailing tube man. And I was just like, okay, I kind of, I mean, it, it's still terrifying. It's just when I thought about that, I'm like, oh, shit, I took, I took myself out of the immersion a bit there because just because of how ridiculous it looked. Um... But it also stands true when, when I call it that because of what it can do with its fucking arm. Like, these things extend out, and it looks straight at Crow, who is the weakest. I think it was because Crow had the most negative emotion going through him. Like, he's in pain. He's, you know, kind of scared that he can't do any. Like, he's, I think he was aware that something was there, and it was threatening Ruby and Co. And I think that's why it was drawn to him more, because he felt helpless. He's like, I, I can't do anything. I want to help, but I can't. And, um... So it goes straight for Crow. Like, it doesn't, like, charge at him. It just extends its arm out, and John, you know, jumps to the rescue. And I'm just looking at this thing like, holy shit, like, <laughs> no wonder this thing's fucking wrecking everybody's shit. So Ren uses his semblance. Like, he's able to shoot it out to John and Crow, and it masks them away from the Grim. So I guess it's not that it masks their emotions. It makes them straight up invisible to whatever Grim is nearby, because this thing was looking right at him, and it looked confused. As shit. Like, okay, there were two people here, where did they go? Like, it was confused. It was looking around like, where the fuck did they go? <laughs> and uh, Nora shoots at it to distract it so that John can get Crow to safety. So Crow's out of the picture for now. Um, but before John rejoins the fight, Crow grabs his arm, but nothing really came of that. Like, I don't know what the point of that was exactly. But uh, so John comes up with the idea of for them to run in circles. I guess that's so it has a harder time following them and hitting them because if they're all moving simultaneously in a circle, it's going to be like, okay, who do I go for? Who do I go for? Shit. Because it kept, like, trying to uh, pin them down to the ground, and it kept missing once they started going in circles. Um, John then tries to cut one of the legs, which I thought was smart, because he wanted to take away this thing's mobility. And so going for, uh, preferably the back legs is a smart idea, or at least, you know, one in the front, one in the back, because that way the thing can't fucking walk. And if you get rid of its mobility, like, it's done. Like, all it can do now is just shoot out its arms and stuff. So, he goes for the leg, and this hor the horse part of the ground, I don't know if they're two separate entities or if they're all the same, or they're both consciously the same being. I want to say they're two different ones. Uh, at least they both have, each one has its own mind, if you will, but they, they work symbiotically together. Um, otherwise, you know, it, it could be that it's just one thing and it just happens to have two heads or two brains or what have you. Actually, I don't think Grimm have internal organs, but, uh, so yeah, Jean hacks at the leg, the horse gets pissed off and basically kicks him in the face. And I was like, oh shit, that had to hurt. I've never been kicked by a horse in the face, but I can't imagine it feeling all that good, especially given how strong horses are. Um, 
And and uh, once that happens, he like puts the sword in his sheath, and then he pulls it out, and it turns into this giant like broadsword. I was just like, oh, that is so fucking cool. And then he hacks at his leg again, and this time it, it gets really pissed off. Like the first cut, it was just like, really, dude? Like that felt like a mosquito bite. This cut, though, that th- the thing reacted. It was like, oh shit, that actually hurt. And then it does like this weird spin thing where it just like s- extends its arms out and just starts smacking everybody. And I was like, oh, they're running in circles. It figured out a way to get past them. I'm like, this thing, or this thing is so damn smart. And um, then it does this weird thing where it like shoots out the, there's these little things in its spine and it shoots them out and breaks like the little, um, I don't know what they are. The, like its mouth was like sewn, it looked like it was sewn together or what have you. And it just like lets out this loud shriek. And I was thinking like, is it calling more grim to it? Because if that's what it's doing, then... Shit's about to get really freaking uh, hectic here, especially if it gets some Nevermores to come to its rescue, or even some, uh, the king, I think they're called King Kaijits, not Kaijits, Taijits, I think that's what it is, the two-headed snake one, or if it brought in one of the scorpion dudes, because if it brings in some of the bigger Grim, uh, the ones that are actually a bit tougher to kill, then, you know, Team Ranger's gonna have a lot of issues here. But um, I guess I was just meant more to kind of freak them out, like psychologically mess with them. Uh, Ren starts shooting at it, he gets pinned to a building, and then my heart, like, literally dropped here for a second, because they tease Nora getting killed off, because she has Ruby shoot her towards Ren, so that she can block the second blow that's coming at Ren, and so, like, as soon as it makes uh, contact with Nora, it, like, cuts to black, and I'm just like, oh, shit, what happened? And they show Nora just, like, I guess it uh, managed to hit Nora, but also push her away from Ren. And so it was basically holding her hammer up against the uh, wall, if I'm describing that correctly. But anyway, like, Ren looks up and sees her, and she's like, stop looking at me, you know, stop looking up my skirt, you pervert. <laughs> I got a laugh out of that. And then I didn't notice it until watching it the uh, latest time before I started doing this review, but she actually grins a little bit at that. So I'm like, okay, you know, this shit, especially after how this episode goes, them as a couple is most certainly a thing now. Like, they are definitely more than just, you know, friends and stuff like that. Like, they have to be. So, anyways, um, they tease Nora getting killed, but she's okay. They have a funny moment, as I said. Then Nora gets slammed around and her aura breaks, and that's when I'm like, oh, okay, maybe that was... Maybe they're teasing it, but maybe they're actually gonna do it. But this pisses Ren off, and he starts stabbing the arm that's holding him, he starts shooting at it, it eventually drops him, and he just, like, goes and, like, charges the thing, and Sean's like, oh, Ren, like, dude, you need to you need to calm down, but he's just recklessly going ape shit on this thing. He ends up getting his aura broken, and they roll under a building after it charges them while Jean basically holds it off. And I'm like, Jean just goes full badass. Like, he straight up does not feel intimidated by this thing at all. Or rather, he is intimidated, but he's acting. Like, he's actually actively doing something and contributing to the team. So I'm hoping when Micah sees this, he actually begins to appreciate Jean a little bit more. I get his reasons for not liking Jean, but. Anyways, I'm hoping Micah comes around to liking him, at least when this episode comes out, or at least liking him a bit more. So Nora reaches with him and tells him, like, dude, I'm not going to let you kill yourself like this. And, um, like, he, he pulls out his dad's dagger, and he starts to realize, like, yes, I'm, I'm letting, you know, that, the anger I feel for this thing get the best of me. And Nora's like, you need, you know, like, after everything we've been through together, I'm not going to let you die like this. Not after how far we've come and how much time we've spent together. And then Ren kind of has his, you know, oh, you know, his little uh, come back to reality and realize that, you know, there are people that care about you and that you do need to survive this thing. And so this is the part of the fight where I was very mixed. So essentially, they all like gather up um, all of Team Ranger and Ruby says that her and John can take care of the arms while Nora gets the horse and then Ren finishes it off. And I was just like, okay, like, well, you haven't really done much damage to it so far. And I thought it would have been better if maybe if it had each of them working individually more so than together. And they each have like conflicting ideas or something like that. But then they like have this moment where they just all like come together fully and take it out. But I, like, I get what they were doing here, but at the same time, I was just like, eh. Or it could have just been like that Ren is acting out of sync with everybody. Like, they have their, like, Nora, Jean, and Ruby all have their plans cut and clear. They understand each other. They're communicating well. 
but Ren's just going in and going in and going in, and that's causing, let's say, Nora to get injured or something like that. And then that could be his moment of realization that once he actually uh, links up with them, like he figures out, like, okay, we definitely need to do this as a team. I can't do this by myself. Then you could have them beat it. But essentially what it boils down to is uh, Ruby manages to pin one of the arms down. Ren uh, tackles it with uh, Jean's shield, and then Jean stabs the other arm. And then Nora comes from a building, or jumps off a building, in a similar way that she killed the um, the Scorpion Grimm in uh, Season 1, Episode 8. And she has, like, that smirk on her face, and I fucking love that smirk. She hits the horse head, which I think knocks... This is why I think it's two different Grimm, because that horse head was not moving. So I was thinking, like, she knocked it out, or it pretty much is dead. And so, you know, that Grimm's basically pinned to the ground, it can't move. So that thing, it, it's screaming in pain and stuff like that. And then Ren just walks up and, you know, says, for my mother. He hacks one arm off, says for his father, hacks the other arm off. Then he slashes it and then he cuts its head off. And every time he went at it, because I'm like, okay, something's going to happen. Like, this thing's going to, like, bite him or something. And I kept gasping every time. I'm like, shit, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. But at the same time, in the back of my head, I'm like, I'm really, like, wor worried for no fucking reason. Because by this point, if they were going to kill somebody... Especially after that funny moment that kind of took a, took you out of the fight a bit. I was like, no, they're not going to kill Ren or Nora. Uh, Crow could die, but I still think he's the red herring. and uh, Which he eventually was, because he makes it out okay. Um, but I one thing I did like about the fight is a bit of... Uh, as anticlimactic as the end was, I do like that it was emotionally uplifting. And... Let's see... It was Ren and Nora finally defeating this nightmarish Grim. Okay, so yeah. It was basically Ren and Nora finally defeating this nightmarish Grim that wrecked Ren's childhood. It was pretty much a moment of, like, you know, not really redemption, but it's like, it's something that's off of Ren's chest. It's like he, he can finally, you know, put the past behind him and move forward because now that he's avenged his parents and everybody else that that thing managed to kill. And in a way, I kind of wish that Nora could have met Ren's mother because I feel like those two would have gotten along so well. Um, but I am very fucking happy that they beat it without any, you know, Raven showing up, Yang showing up, or any of that other ex machina type shit. Um, or they didn't even need Ruby's silver eyes or unlocking Sean's uh, semblance. So they just beat it by working as a team, and I'm okay with that. I just feel like they could have gone about it a little bit better. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like one of those uh, wrestling matches where the match itself is good, but the outcome even though the guy that you wanted to win wins the way that he got to the win kind of leaves you feeling a bit empty so um it was just an underwhelming finish it wasn't a bad finish just underwhelming uh but again it may have been that i overhyped the fight in my own head or i don't know uh but yeah this this fight though it occupies about half the episode so um and yeah, I mean, this Grim was not by any stretch of the imagination some like pushover, weak ass Grim. This Grim was probably the strongest one that our main characters have actually encountered. Okay, so I had to get a drink of water there. My throat was getting pretty dry. So yeah, that's basically the end of the fight. Let's see, I'm at 20. Damn, I'm at 20 minutes already. I was hoping to get this done in 10 minutes, but there was a lot to talk about with this in depth type stuff. So once they defeat the Grim, um, these guys from Mistral show up in these. Uh, like these little flying machines. If you watch the uh, World of Remnant video, um, you can see uh, the type of things that Mistral has. So anyways, they show up, and I'm like, how do they know to find them? And they said that they saw the smoke. So I'm assuming it was the, either the smoke from the buildings or it was the big puff of smoke that that's uh, Grim let out once it was dead. Oh, and uh, the way that uh, Ren kills it is he decapitates the top half, so I guess you didn't need to kill the horse part of it, or it, that horse part was already dead from Nora's blow, so... I think it's. I don't think it's really conclusive either way, but I'm. I'm going to assume it was just one complete grim that just had two different heads. Um, so they make it to Mistral, and you can see the crows, you know, resting. And Mistral looks like the. It's. It's basically this town built into this mountain type thing. Um, I would show an image, but I'm trying to avoid showing any images from uh, the episode because I don't want them accidentally getting shown as like one of the. Uh, one of the, like, uh, snapshots on YouTube or something like that. But, uh, well, I mean, even then, I could just change it. But uh, I'm going to let you guys see it for yourselves, uh, rather than me just popping it up here. Or, well, I mean, I would hope that you've seen the episode by now. But basically, it, it looks very fantastical, and I do like the way that it looks. And so they get to, I, I want to say they're in Haven. 
Or unless the kingdom and the city are named the same, like they're both named Mistral. I'm going to assume it's Mistral. Anyway, well, they are in Mistral. But anyways, uh, Ruby starts writing this letter, and the music that plays as she's writing it is very soothing. Like, it's, it's that kind of calming... You know, we made it through all the shit, and now we can finally, you know, rest a bit. And we can kind of celebrate a little bit. But, uh, so she writes a letter to Yang, and her letter shows that uh, she knows she was being reckless and that she has now matured as a person because she realizes that, uh, you know, all the shit that went down with Tyrion, Crow getting poisoned, and the Nuklevi, she sees that the world is dangerous. When, if you think back to Volume 1... She romanticized the idea of being a huntress, but now I think she's coming to terms with the reality that being a huntress isn't about, you know, the heroic tales and stuff like that. It's about survival as well. In fact, even more so, it is about survival and less about the, you know, the glory of killing all these grim or defeating all these monsters and stuff. I mean, that's, that is your job. That is your career path. But at the same time, it's like you, you still are putting your life on the line and people will die in your you know, time. It's not like you and your friends get to go in, kill the monsters, and go home and be happy. That's not always going to happen. But uh, thankfully, it did happen this time. And so, um, let's see. Yeah, they get rescued by Mistral's people, transported to. I haven't written his haven. Uh, they saw the smoke of the Grim, so yeah, that explained that. Crow gets treated, so he's better now. Um, and then it kind of flashes to the other characters, like Blake looking at the old White Fang flag, which is a blue flag with the white wolf thing, and it doesn't have the claw marks, it's just a white wolf head. Um, because she's talking about taking the white thing back from Adam and Sienna Khan and just making it into the force of good that it used to be. So, I think that'll be an interesting conflict, her versus Adam, because I don't see them going with this redemption arc for Adam. I think Adam has just completely fallen to basically the dark side. Um, especially with his involvement with, uh, what happened at Beacon Academy. Like, he's responsible for a lot of fucking people dying. As well as Blake, uh, as well as Yang losing her arm and all this other shit. And indirectly, he's responsible for the death of uh, Pyrrha, if you think about it. Um, I say indirectly because he contributed to the scenario that it led to with Pyrrha, uh, with um, Amber getting killed and then Pyrrha also dying, trying to defeat Cinder. So anyways, moving on from that. Um, Yang heads for Mistral, and you kind of get the hint that she's going there when she says, you're in so much trouble when I find you. Because I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, yeah, she won't say that to her mom. Uh, but she'll definitely say that to Ruby, so. Um, and then Weiss manages to escape on a cargo ship that is bound for Mistral. Um, so, basically, everybody's going to Mistral. So, we'll be seeing Team Ruby uniting in Season 5. Um, I'm thinking early on, it'll be, like, they'll come together again. And then maybe split up again at the end of 5 or at the end of 6 or something like that. Uh, it just depends on how it goes. Like, I could see Ruby and Weiss going one way, Blake and Yang going another. Um, I definitely see Blake and Yang versus Adam occurring, though, or maybe Adam and Sienna Khan, or who the hell knows. But, I mean, I guess it just depends, because uh, Adam plans to overthrow the White Fang and take, or not overthrow the White Fang, but overthrow Sienna Khan and take over. Although, I'm assuming that's if Sienna Khan doesn't bend the knee to Salem. Like, I'm wondering if that's why, because uh, if you think about it, Salem is sending Hazel to meet with the leader of the White Fang, but at the same time, Adam is plotting to overthrow Sienna Khan. So I'm wondering if Hazel's being sent there to say, hey, Sienna, bend the knee or else, and then Adam's going to kill him if he doesn't. I'm not entirely sure how it's going to go down, but it'll be interesting to see. Uh, see. So yeah, Weiss is on a cargo ship. Jean and Ren all have this like nice little scene together where Jean's sitting at the end of this bed, or uh, yeah, at the end of this bed, He's looking at his shield and namely, you know, the Pure logo or Pure logo, the uh, emblem of Pira that he put onto the shield that he got from the blacksmith. And uh, Ren and Nora, they walk in, they all sit together. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's a nice little moment where they can just kind of sit there and relax and enjoy the fact that they're, you know, they're still alive and kicking. Uh, let's see. And yeah, I said Team Ruby will likely be uniting for season five, which makes me wonder. Yeah, I'm actually curious if Jean and Co will get a fourth member, like maybe Oscar, because Oscar. Also makes it to uh, Mistral. We get a short scene with him on the train, which we don't see Hazel for some reason, because I thought that him and Hazel were both on the same train, but I guess not. Uh, but at the uh, end credit scene, uh, you get to see him walk in, and he talks to the girl. He's like, I think I'm supposed to ask you for my cane back. And then, you know, he hands him the cane and says, good to have you back, Oz. So, let's see. But yeah, I wonder if, like, they'll get uh, Oscar as a new uh, member, or... You know, maybe a certain umbrella-wielding girl who has to change a heart. 
Um, I could also see Neo working with Watts because Watts kind of reminds me of Roman to a slight degree. Um, but yeah, if Neo joined with Team Juniper. Oh, they could make Team Junior. Um, I don't know. Let me see here. Let's see. We have. Trying to see Juniper. It could actually. I think they could do. No, they couldn't do another range. I'm actually not sure what the hell they would call it. But anyways, I'm not going to dwell on that for too much. Plus, it's probably not going to happen. Um, I could see Neo turning good though. At least I hope she does. Like, I want to see at least one character, or you know, one character from each side switch sides. Uh, which we might actually get that with uh, Leo, because as it turns out, he's the informant that Watts is uh, supposed to meet with. Uh, surprise, surprise. But what I'm thinking about that is that I think uh, Salem and Watts have both intimidated Leo into working with him, if, especially if he's based on the Cowardly Lion. It would make sense for somebody who was a coward to basically be forced into working with them rather than willingly doing it. Uh, especially if they're doing like the references to the Wizard of Oz. Um, so anyways, uh, quick couple of predictions of mine. I think that uh, because Ruby says it in her letter to Yang that she's going to go meet with uh, the Headmaster Leo. And I think when they go to meet with him, Watts is going to show up and he's going to uh, thank her for what she did to Cinder. You know, kind of a callback to episode one of this volume. I, I think that would be freaking awesome if he said that. But uh, I think they're going to find out fairly early on that uh, Leo is hiding something. Uh, maybe not outright figure it out completely, but they'll definitely be like, yeah, Leo's a bit off. Um, and he might be, you know, subtly hinting at them like, you guys need to get the fuck out of here. Shit's about to go down and I don't want you guys here. Or something along those lines. Um, we did not get to see Sienna Cobb. I am like 100% certain we're going to be seeing him next volume, especially if Adam and Hayes are going to be, you know, interacting with them. Um, I think he might get killed next volume as well by either Adam or somebody else, or it could just uh, turn into a situation of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, basically Sienna Cobb works with... Um, Team Ruby and Blake and whatnot, maybe unwillingly, or not unwillingly, but maybe with ulterior motives later on down the line, but for the moment, he agrees to work with them just to betray them later on. That might happen. Um, oh, yeah, there is one other scene I forgot to mention. Uh, is Cinder getting her, basically, I guess you could call it therapy by having Emerald project images of Ruby into her head just so that she could burn them. I was like, this is morbid, but very Cinder-like. And I mean, Salem definitely proves because she was smiling as uh, Cinder was burning this uh, Ruby clone, essentially. Although there is a tiny, I mean, this is, I, I don't know if this is really considered a plot hole or not, but it was Ruby in her new getup, which Cinder has not seen, or rather Emerald has not seen. Um, I'm wondering if that's just, you know, it's something they kind of overlooked or what the deal is, but I mean, it's it's such a small thing that it did. I didn't really bother me at all. It's just something I picked up on. Um, but yeah, that pretty much yeah, because I already talked about the uh, end credit scene with uh, Oscar and Crow. So it'll be interesting to have uh, Oscar meet with and talk to like Ruby, Sean, and all them. That'll be interesting to see. Um, and then I can also see this like big throwdown going. It, at a haven. I could see all of Salem's crew basically going there. So you could have Watts, Tyrion, Cinder, and Hazel all throwing down with, you know, Crow, Ironwood, if he decides to go there, and all these other characters and stuff like that. And that excites me, but it also terrifies me because it makes me think that, yeah, somebody's going to die. Um, I don't know who, I don't know when, and I don't know how, but somebody is definitely going to kick the bucket at some point. Um, so overall, this volume, it, it, it felt very, it felt, um, Again, I like. I think people overhyped it to be bigger than it really was, or that it was bigger than it was supposed to be because of how like big and awesome Volume Three was. Because that was kind of like a big. Uh, it was just a big, you know, release of like all the conflict that had been built up to that point. Where Season Four is kind of like a restart. But it's like them hitting the restart button to progress the story forward. So this was meant to just set up more of the world of Remnant and just introduce us to more of these characters and just sort of get the ball rolling again. And then season five, we'll see things pick up. And then season six, we'll probably see another big uh, blowout season, if you will, where it's just balls to the wall action. Everything's going down. Haven's burning to the ground. Everybody's trying to save it. Probably see some more badass Grim pop up because the Grim designs keep getting scarier and scarier. 
And so, you know, it may get to a point where the Nook Levine doesn't seem all that bad anymore. Like, we actually kind of miss him because he's actually now cute and cuddly compared to these new vicious things that they've got. Which, there's one on the Ruby fan page. It's basically a Chimera. Which I think would be fucking scary as shit because it's basically three Grim tied to one body, which I think would be cool as shit. Especially if they're going the route of just including all these mythical beasts. Especially ones that we haven't actually, you know, really seen much of. Because the Nook Levine, I don't think, was very well known. As a uh, mythical monster, you know, as far as like uh, the Ruby, not not just the Ruby fan base, but just, you know, mythical creature fan base in general. Like, it's not one of the more talked about ones. So it's like, you know, what the hell is this thing? And then people start looking around. It's like, oh shit, that thing's terrifying. But uh, anyways, I've rambled on long enough, I believe. And I think you guys get the idea that I like this volume. I think it was overhyped by fans. And that's not to, that's not to crap on anybody. I mean, I've overhyped myself on things and, you know, kind of felt a bit disappointed. But... At the same time, I think I think once volumes five and six come out, volume four will will get the love that it honestly deserves. So yeah, uh, kudos to Rooster Teeth for making a great volume, and I look forward to seeing volume five. So with that being said, folks, let me know what you thought down below, and I shall see you all for whatever video I upload next.